right? Boy, would that be something, wouldn't it? And, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. Now, we're not going to really get into the money part until next week, but I will say this, that once they found out their money train was gone, they weren't very happy about that. And by the way, that's, that's part of devil possession, too. That's part of the devil working. When they find out that the gospel is opposing them, or they, they see the gospel as opposition to them and the merchants, we've seen that downtown. We've seen that every place we've ever preached. What happens? Well, they don't like it because they think that it affects their funds. It affects their money. They don't like it, do they? Yeah, I, I, I believe you, you can see all these things. We'll talk about that. Father, Lord, thank you. We pray you bless us now. Show us from your text and your word the truth that we need in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wherever there is the gospel preached, there will always be witches that oppose it. Mark it down, always. Wherever the gospel is preached, you'll always have devil-possessed people that will oppose it. They will, stand, they will stand in opposition. They have to. They cannot help it. Just as the Lord has his soldiers, Satan has his. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience and the men and women possessed by them are ever ready to fight against the gospel and the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are ready to fight against the Lord's people. Now, I love the book of Acts because it shows us so much of the history of the Lord's church, but it's also like a manual of understanding of what it looks like to preach the gospel, to organize churches, and to have the devil oppose you all and every step of the way, because it will happen. Some men say those were Bible times, and we, we, t we say to them, no, these are Bible times. And the things that those men faced, we still face today. And if you're preaching the same gospel those men are, in the same manner in which those men are, churches will fight that opposition all the time. And out on the street, whether it's there or here, you will, you will see that opposition wherever you go. The devil will fight the Lord, the gospel, and the churches. That's what he does. If you think for one moment that you and I don't face mocking devils, possessed, pe devil-possessed people that oppose the gospel... That lie and slander, that lie and wait to deceive, that are filled with devils and seek to trap men of God and hurt the church and the character and assassinate the character of the preachers? Well, then you've not been to down, downtown to preach the gospel ever. <laughs> I can tell you that because they always lie about us. Every time we go, they lie about us. If there's any opposition at all, they always lie. They have to. Tornado warning. Okay, that's okay. We're here. Take shelter in the basement. You're in the best place you can be. All right. Anyway. Man, that's loud. Yeah, right here. We are a basement. Here it comes. I was kidding. I'm sorry. Did I scare somebody? Hope you have insurance, Dave. <laughs> Oh, huh. maybe a house fell on a witch. <laughs> kidding, <laughs> kidding. Yeah. But think about that. I was going to say, the other thing is, you, you haven't met my dad's neighbor yet if you don't think people are devil-possessed <laughs> and, and oppose the gospel, <laughs> right? I also find it interesting that, that look at the timing of the opposition. These men were on their way to prayer. They were on their way to go pray. They were on their way to a prayer meeting, right? They're going to go pray and Satan, you mean Satan would oppose you and use people to oppose you when you go to prayer? Oh man, I'm telling you what, when you try to pray, I'll tell you, you could be in your house trying to pray and man, everybody will have something they got to do, right? They got to be loud. Something's got to happen. Something's got to go. Kids start screaming out of nowhere, right? All kinds of stuff. You're trying to do your Bible devotion, something happened. So that's not Satan stirring anything up. Really? I... How about that? Seems to happen at that time. Right? 
See, Satan, he hates prayer. All prayer is that offensive weapon in your arsenal against him. All prayer will cause the devils to flee. So then don't be surprised when Satan and his devils attack your mind during prayer. When they come after you to attempt to hinder your prayers or distract you and to stop you from praying. That's one of the first lessons you can see here is the devil opposes prayer. Don't forget that. He hates it. Satan hates it when you pray. He opposes it. Stands against it. And he'll stand against your prayer, try to stand against you and keep you from praying. You ever find it some days it's harder to pray than others? You just feel like there's a, a wall there in your mind or between you and God and, and you just feel like you can't get anything out. You ever been that way before? Well, a lot of times that's what that is. Satan opposing us. His kingdom opposing us. That's, that's what he does. I mean, that's, that's, his, that's his whole, right now, that's his whole reason to exist. Is to oppose the gospel. Is to oppose prayer. Right? And he should hate it. Because it's the death knell to his operation. Prayer stops him in his tracks. It halts his work against you. And he's defenseless against prayer. Satan cannot... Once, once God's people start praying and they earnestly and fervently pray, he, he can do nothing. That's why he hates it so much. That's why he wants to keep you from praying, right, to distract your mind. But number one, let me say this. First of all, men are still possessed by devils today. Just like this, this girl is possessed by a devil here, you and I have to understand this great truth. I can't bang that drum loud enough and long enough to remind you of the exhortation that is given to us. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You are wrestling devils or if you're a hillbilly you're wrestling devils but that's what you're doing right you're wrestling devils that's your whole life uh when it comes to opposing the kingdom of this world that's part of your whole existence all the way to heaven i'm reading this book right now um oh what is that big gurnall book the the christian complete armor I, i'm about 200 and 25 pages into that. You see, that doesn't sound like much, but it's double columned. So I'm actually 450 pages in, really. But the whole thing's like 2,000 pages. It's humongous. And I, I really want to read that. But one of the things that he talks about is you just better get ready. I mean, you're in a war of your life until you go home. Like, it is constant war. Basically, he just goes at every different angle for you to understand that. And what God is explaining to us is it's a war, and you're going to fight it. Or you're going to lose. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I've, I've preached this to you. I've said this to you before. Our battles are spiritual battles. Our wars are spiritual wars. Our opposition is spiritual opposition. If you lose sight of this, you will. Listen to me. Here's the number one thing that happens to people when they lose sight of this. They start seeing human instruments and want to take revenge upon them. Your mom, your dad, your neighbor, whoever it is, the person that wronged you, you will want to seek revenge on them if you lose sight of this. That there's a spirit in them. There's a spirit that leads most of them. Right? It's a wrestling match that we're in. We wrestle devils, and he uses human instruments. Paul warns us that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. They're, they're just human instruments. You wonder when you go out and you preach the gospel and you see that opposition, or all of a sudden you go to work and people hate you for, like, no reason at all. And you wonder, like, well, why do these people hate me so much? They don't hate you. They don't know. First of all, they don't know why they hate you. They don't know why they hate you. Right? 
but they hate you, some of them. Why? Because they have a spirit in them that flies in and out of them at, at his will. And that's what he does. And that's how they operate. And that's the opposition that they have. They don't even know you. They just know that you're different than them and they don't like that. Right? You see, possession and dealing with someone is, is more common than you might think. And it isn't being a werewolf or a vampire or like the exorcist having green spew come out of your mouth or your head spinning all the way around or levitation across the room or anything stupid like that. Right? It isn't anything like that. What is it? Can those things happen? Sure, Satan can do a lot of things. But do they? Not likely that often. It's much simpler than that. Possession is simpler than that. It's opposition to the gospel. It's opposition to the Lord's work. Deception. It's satanic opposite. Yeah, deception. It's satanic opposition to the Lord's work under the guise of deceptive behavior. Correct. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Right. There's a veil. Amen. Right? I see it in my dad's next door neighbor who brought up the gospel like out of nowhere. Right? He had, to make, he had to let me know that, why don't you go preach to those Fruit Loops? He didn't say that. I'm just using that term. Down in Minneapolis. And then he began to say the most vulgar and disgusting and filthy, dirty things. Now, why would he say that to me? Why would he say that? Because of the spirit that's in him. Right. They, they oppose the gospel. They hate the gospel. Right? Devils. Opposing the gospel. When I looked over at him, I said, he ain't no different than everybody else I face when I go downtown and preach the gospel. He's no different than everybody we preach to. They're, they're all the same. If you look at that when you're out in work and you deal with these people, just remember, they're all the same. They all have the same spirit in them. Right? They, they're all, they all have that. It's like, I, I've, I've mentioned this to you before, but I'll mention it again. I had one guy get so mad he left this church, which was okay because he got baptized by a woman and I laughed at it and said, no, I wouldn't baptize. I, you'd have to be baptized to be a member here because we don't let women baptize anybody, right? Just because some Pentecostal witch baptized you. Amen. Was that firm enough? I think that was pretty clear. And by the way, we only believe in Baptist baptism here. That, that's, what we, that's what we follow. That's what we believe because it's scriptural and we don't apologize for it. And I don't care if anybody doesn't like it. And I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that. Because if you don't like it, we don't want you here anyway. I mean, that, is, that, is that simple? Man, I think that's really, I think that's not going to get me any fans. And that's okay. Because I don't need any of those. Because they will hurt you. But uh, <laughs> fans hurt you. But uh, anyway, <laughs> friends are good. Fans are bad. Okay? I'm sorry. They just, they just are. That's the way it works. All right? But we don't apologize for those stands that we take, right? But I, I remember telling this guy, I said, well, those people in Congress are a bunch of devil-possessed drunks. And he goes, no, they're not. They're this and they're that. And I was like, those people are possessed. I said, what does the Bible say about children? I think that's the conversation. I said they were drunks for sure, and I'm pretty sure I said they were, they were possessed. If they don't have the spirit of God in them, what do they have? The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience that flies in and out of them at his will and does whatever, right? Does whatever he wants takes him captive at his will yeah they they want that power that's what they like right so number two devils in the devils uh in possessed people must manifest themselves they have to see whenever you're out preaching the gospel look at paul what's paul doing off to prayer but before he gets to prayer gotta have some spiritual oppression come his way right Satan's got to try to afflict him, right? So he sends in this devil-possessed lady to follow him around to afflict him, right? To afflict him and oppress him before he goes in there. They can't help but manifest themselves. You have to understand that. A certain damsel, it says, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by, by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. This is very similar to Mark chapter 5, when those devils had to manifest themselves too. Whenever Christ was around preaching, if they were around, they had to say something. Have you ever been preaching somewhere? Yes, you have, I know. You've been preaching somewhere? Right, I'm getting to that. I've got that written in already, Dave. But... 
but you know what? Have you ever been somewhere and and these you're preaching the, and these people have to know how they have to let you know how vulgar they are. They have to hail Satan. They have to say whatever they can. And you're like, when they hail Satan, they're act like you act like we're surprised you're hailing Satan. Like we're not. I mean, are we supposed to be shocked by that? That's why we're are we there. are we supposed to be shocked that you worship the God of this world? Do you think you're shocking us with that? We expect that. We just know most people aren't as honest as you. They just won't say it, but they believe it, right? They follow it. They do the same things. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Now, we don't have time to look at all that, but those are all signs of possession as well. Cutting and everything else. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Why did he say that? Because he had to make himself, he had to worship the Lord. Yeah. And he had to make himself manifest. Oh, that's the Son of God. Now, he did it for another reason, which we're going to get to. They do it for, they manifest for another reason. That's not the only reason they manifest. Right. Yeah, I thee by God. yeah that thou torment me not. For he said unto, unto him, come out of that man. Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So that's one account of it. And in Luke chapter 4, verse number 33, how about this? The devil even shows up to church. Has that happened before? You bet it has. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that'd be a good sermon title, When the Devil Came to Church. <laughs> no pictures. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, and hurt him not. Even in the church house or the meeting time, you'll have that. I remember when I was back in, see, we were, when I first got saved back in Iowa, you remember that Hannah, that guy that was in the middle, the, the preacher, Pastor Bray was preaching, that guy started acting really weird. Yeah, and he, fa he like faked this seizure in the middle of the room. And like, and he wasn't like the paramedics came and said, there's nothing wrong with this guy. He faked this seizure in the middle of the room, right? During the preaching and just like interrupted everything. Yeah. And he did it like, yeah, I, I remember that. I was like, man, that is strange, but I've seen stranger things. So that, that that's not, doesn't seem that weird now, but it was weird then, I guess. But <laughs> I'm going to tell you why they manifest that way in a little while. We'll get to that because I want to explain something to you. There's another reason why they do that, the way they do it. Number four or three, whatever number it is, the demonic presence must mock the gospel. They have to mock the gospel. They can't help it. They have to mock it. There's more than one way to mock the gospel, by the way. It's to out and out mock it or it's to mock that you believe it in that sense, the way that they did, or that you're trying to do something with it to pervert people. And it came to pass as he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying, right? And this she did many days. So she followed around Paul, right? Many days. As you see, when they're possessed, they can't help but mock the gospel. How many street preaching videos have you seen? How many times have you seen that very thing when you're out there that people mock the gospel? Remember that man that would... that. When I first started preaching the gospel that Joshua's doppelganger that stood on his head and he, he stood on his head, he, he used different voices, he, he sat there and did little dances and all those things. I mean, I've seen it. You're preaching the gospel and 300 pound old crazy fat dudes start, um, start skipping down the road like, like sodomites, like little girls skipping down the road. Uh, one time I was with Lucius and I think it was Garrick and Samuel maybe, and Paul. And we were out there. Remember that lady that kept doing that yoga in front of us? Do you remember that weird lady? She was doing the most provocative, nasty yoga, weird stuff. And she was like out of nowhere. She just comes popping up, and she just starts doing that out of nowhere. Right? 
The break, the guy that break danced for three hours straight. And it was like 90 degrees outside. With a phone that wouldn't die. <laughs> was he dressed like Aladdin? No. That was another guy. Wasn't there someone dressed like Sinbad? Is that who you're talking about? I, I kind of remember that. So we have a lot of stories. I mean, if you just if you stick around long enough, you'll you'll start to hear a lot of them, Joy. You really will. You'll hear a ton of them, right? Would you say that Paul was great because he made it impossible for them to go pray? Well, I'm going to get to that actually. Yep, I'm going to actually explain that his grievance and and things like that too. But that's part of it, yeah, because he could because that's part of it because it was a, it was yeah yeah it it, it dominated his mind. And, you know, in that sense, it attacked his mind. And it's right in front of him to see, so it's going to affect him. Just like your prayers are affected, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, anytime you have that satanic oppression around you, you're going to have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to affect you. That's, what, that's why Satan does it. That's his, that's his point. You know, so we've seen these, the, the Sodomites saying that they were going to preach the gay gospel. Remember that, Paul? Yeah. Remember the gay gospel? Preach a gay gospel to you. Remember he kept yelling it out and Paul drilled the gospel in his ear when he was. <laughs> I'm surprised that man still has an eardrum if he does. <laughs> I cannot believe how hard you preach to that guy's ear right there. I just, I can't. Because he got right in Paul's face and, and we were trying to get him like back and it wasn't happening. And he was just like right. And then he was like chasing my son around. Come here, kid. Right? Provoking spirit. Right? We've seen it. How about the charismatics that come by when you're preaching the gospel and they want to lay hands on you? Right? They want to lay hands on you and heal you, right? They want to impart something to you. Right? Every time when, you, when they're around, they want to impart something. Now, see, you don't think of it like that. But I'm telling you, that's what's going on right here, and that's what happens to you, too, when you go preach the gospel. It's, it's the same thing. Right? Yeah, why won't you hug me? Don't you love us? Right? So you don't want me to lay hands on you? Remember that, Jacob? Remember that blonde girl in the store that found my wallet? I left my wallet at the police station. I don't know. I had to go to the police station for some reason. This doesn't sound good. But when I was there at the police station, I left it. Remember? Wasn't what? That, of the devil? that was because the devil got into our van. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. I thwarted her. <laughs> I guess that's another example. Right? And I took my wallet there, and I left my wallet on the... Look, can we get done with this tornado stuff already? I'm trying to preach here. This is a... This is distracting. <laughs> right? I mean, tornadoes interrupt and preach in preaching. Don't worry, it's my watch going off. So it's. What's that? It's all of your phones. All those people, right? What do they have? What do they have in common? They all oppose the gospel. They all have the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Don't be surprised when that satanic opposition is there. Can I, can I, like that girl kept asking us, remember, can I lay hands on you? Not a word from the guy. Look, I don't let women touch me, all right? Except my wife. I don't, I don't, you're not touching me with your little devils. <laughs> Keep your devils to yourself. <laughs> we don't want none of those. Oh, yeah, I remember that one guy. If you weren't wearing that GoPro right now, I would just kill you. <laughs> No, the pastor's the one that knocked it off of me. Man, was he mad. That was epic footage. 
And What's his name? Fix it up. That was that was WrestleMania, right? Yeah. All right, moving along. <laughs> number five. Number, number five. Come on, let's go. We don't have to bring up all the devils, okay? Um, what? 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 Why did she preach that to them? Because devils preach. That's why. The, the devil that was in her, why, why did that devil in her preach? Because devils preach, that's why. That's what they do. They what? do it in a mocking form, basically? Yeah. yeah. Oh, they preach in a real form. Oh. I'll show you. They do that, too. You yeah, you have. Because devils preach. They're religious. They do this for a number of reasons we're going to talk about. Sometimes we can be confused, and that's the first reason. You want to know why she kept saying, these be the servants of the Most High God? You know why she said that? To confuse. Mm -hmm. That's why. To confuse you. One of the number one ways that you can be confused is by false prophets. False prophets are confusing. But wait, she preached what was true. Yeah, but think now, the order is all wrong. Number one, here's a woman, right, following around Paul, saying these men are the servants of the Most High God and showing to us the way of salvation. They confuse people. I've served the Lord with men for years only to find out they were devil-possessed witches, so I know what that's like. Amen. Amen. Confusion. You know, Lee asked me a few years ago, he goes, he goes a couple times, he asked me, why? He goes, I hear these people, and I hear them preach, and I hear them, you know, they, they, they know things, they preach the Bible, they do these things. And then they go off into Crazyville and they, they turn completely away from the truth, right? We're not talking about theological disagreements here. We're talking about they just turn and they do what they do and you stand around, you wonder. Some of the young preachers, preachers that we had here that were here and you watch them and you hear them and they sound so sincere, right? They sound so passionate. They sound so sincere, and you wonder. But let me tell you something. This is where 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 applies. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They're possessed, and they have the power of devils to do it. Look, I've had people, I've had men, I've had people come here and say, I, I, and tell people, hey, I agree, I agree with Pastor Cooley on everything. And I disagree with Pastor, look, I don't agree with Pastor Cooley on everything, okay? I don't. And if you told me you did, I wouldn't believe you. Right? Because you're telling me, if you told me that, I wouldn't believe you anyway. And they said, and they said well, I, I watched you for a few years before I came here. And basically what you said was, what you did was, is you mimicked mm -hmm. yeah. me. You watched me. You copied yourself after me. And then you turned yourself by the power of Satan. That's how they do it, by the way. By the power of Satan. That's how it happens. They're transformed. And you wonder, and they look so, they look like so perfect in some ways, right? Like you have your flaws. Like sometimes you're just not very nice, yeah. right? Sometimes you're a jerk, right? And you got to repent of it, right? Sometimes. I, don't, I guess I'm the only jerk today. But uh, I, I've seen some of you. You've been jerks. But, uh, <laughs> but some, right? Some, you're human and you make mistakes and you have to repent and you have to get right. But they don't ever look like that. They make themselves to look like. They're not like that. And why is that? How do they do that? The power of Satan. That's how they do it. But guess the, the one thing that they don't have that God's people have is they don't have staying power. See, eventually, because they don't have the Holy Ghost, eventually they fall out. Eventually, they can't take it anymore. 
And those that are real, they stick to the book and they continue on for the Lord with all their flaws and with all their, uh, with all their, uh, with all their human frailties and everything else that you and I have. We continue on for the Lord. But those that, that have that fake polish to them, that never look like they ever do it, 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 it becomes manifest who they are. So it should be no great thing when you see that, right? But it's meant to shake you. It's meant to confuse you. Because I'll be honest with you, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that very thing. Being very confused myself about that. Being very shaken by that and confused by that. And and riddled by that. And and, uh, full of anxious anxiety and full of doubts and full of fears about things like that. Wondering how in the world could that be? Well, take all of that to the Lord and say, God, don't let it be me. Please help me continue on for you. (laughs) Please fix me. Continue to work on me. Continue to make me who you want me to be. And let me not fall for that. That's what you do with those fears and doubts. That's what you do with that confusion. Because that's why this devil kept saying that. Why? She had a spirit of divination in her. And what she was doing she, the, the devil that was in her, what this woman was doing under the, under the uh, possession of this devil was trying to bear witness to who Christ was and to who Paul was so people would think that they were all on the same team. Yes. So that, to think that they were all working together. Yep. So then the people there who went to that woman and paid her money for divination and paid her master's money for divination, they would think they, their trade would not be hurt by Paul. Because they would be like, well, we're all the same. Yeah. These are the servants of the Most High God. That's who they are, and, 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 and we're bearing witness to them being that. See, that's why the devil's always manifested when Christ was around, and that's why he told them to be quiet and come out of them, because he didn't want their witness, because he knew all their witness was was to be confusing. Yeah. It was to, meant to confuse. That's why Satan does it. He does it to confuse you. That's, that's why he does it to the, that's why those tares are among the wheat. That's why those, those people are there. It, it's, it's for confusion. That's the point of it. You know, this divination that she was doing, the soothsaying is an attempt to reveal secrets and to foretell the future. It's forbidden by God's word. We've looked at Deuteronomy 18 many times. It talks about that spirit of divination. It talks about having that spirit inside, uh, that, that spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience inside of them. Now, some divination is phony, and it's practiced by fakes, right? But some is of the devil. Acts chapter 16, we see that. This girl was truly possessed by a spirit, and she was able to tell secrets about people. And because she was able to do that, because why? Is it because she could do it with her own mind and she was clairvoyant or whatever? And this, No, it's because the devils watched those people do those things and told that woman what they were doing. Right? That's why, just like they tell future events like that, just like people tell future events like that on a, on a minor scale like that, and you're like, how were they able to do that? Well, don't let that shake you. Just like what happened, that spirit of divination that, 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 that the witch at Endor had. How was she able to do it? Well, because the spirit came up and told him exactly what was going to happen. And made it happen, by the way. Made Saul do what he did. Not made him, but led him to do what he did. If you look at Saul's actions and the way that he handled himself, it, it was because of what that spirit told him. He, he was, it was predictive programming. He just went right into it. He just followed it. That's why you and I are to follow the scriptures, not spirits of divination and voices and thoughts and feelings and everything else. Amen. The devil wanted to mix the truth with error so that people would be confused and would think that witchcraft is of God. That's what the charismatic movement is. It's witchcraft mixed with Christianity. And it's to confuse people. That's what the priestcraft is. Does the same thing. Roman Catholicism, well, if it's older and it's mysterious and you wear really funny robes and you have little bottles of, of uh, a, a little uh, hookahs full of opium that you're shaking around, then it makes you look like you're really, I mean, you're really of the faith there. Because I'm sure Jesus walked around shaking a chain like this with opium in it and, and, and shaking it like this and having people do all that stuff. 
right? But no, it's older and it's mysterious. So what does it do? It attracts the flesh. What's that, brother? It does add new meaning to high church. That's right. That's all, all that's, and I'm, and I'm just kidding. I know that's not really opium, okay? I just, I just like to give people a hard time. I like to mock them, okay? I, I, you know, they mock the gospel, but we mock like Elijah does. We mock their gods, their little tiki gods. What's that? Smoking mirrors over across the way. Yeah. You talking about when we were over at, uh, when that guy was kissing those pictures outside of the door? This, that, there was a, a Greek Orthodox priest and he had a really long beard and he had his own robes and he had pictures of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which I don't know how he knew what they looked like. How did they do that? Maybe devils. I don't know. But anyway, and they would kiss pictures of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or whatever when they walked in there and they had all the, and they had their incense burning and all their, all their, what's that? All their candles and everything. And, and he told my wife one time, he said, well, if you ever want to find out about, what was it, how did he say that? Of how the, the ancient church or something like that, I don't remember what he said to you, it was something like that, uh, you know, uh, how the ancient church does this or something like that. And, and, what was it? The origin of the original Christian church. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And that's what they were, and I'm like, yeah, I got the origin, it's right here in plain English that I can read. And I don't have to dress like a girl to have it either. I don't have to act like that. I don't have to wear that. I don't have to do that. You know, Satan, wanted to, he wanted to cause problems with that. He wanted to mix, the, mix air with truth. You know, I like what, what this man says here. We cannot accept the testimony of the world. It is confusion for God's people to allow unbelievers to testify for them. An example of this is when some ecumenical organizations have used the testimonies of rock musicians and sports or Hollywood stars who are perhaps a little religious but who do not have a clear testimony of the new birth and do not have godly testimonies. And they use them to promote Christianity, kind of like Lecrae. Yeah. That's not water. That's actually a rapper. But... <laughs> Not, not LaCroix, but Lecrae, right? But we know Lecrae, a rapper, right? And he's, they use people like him. Or how about Kanye West? Right? Right, Tim Tebow, right? Right, all of them. How many? Alice Cooper. <laughs> Brother Bush. Trumpy. Right? The Trumpster. Right? He's a real Christian brother there, that guy. Right? And the Duck Dynasty. Yeah, who could forget about Duck Dynasty? <laughs> you know, we cannot join hands with unbelievers and false teachers in the work of God. It's confusion. For those who observe this think that we are putting our stamp of approval upon false teachers when people see that, like Billy Graham who denied hell and denied the flames of hell and everything else and lulled the world to sleep and brought people right into Rome and got paid handsomely to do it too. From Bishop Fult, uh, his, his uh, handler, Bishop Fulton Sheen, who was on a train with him, right? And made a deal with him, him and the Pope. And they made their deal together and they sold out biblical Christianity completely. I, rem I remember reading uh, people like John R. Rice who warned Billy Graham and those men, they warned him, you better, you better get away from this. You're heading in the wrong direction, man. You better quit it now. Right? Yeah. They warned him, but he was too big. For, he was a big shot for them. And Rome was, was filling his coffers. Rome fills his events. Those Billy Graham events and all those things, those are filled by Rome. Yep. They do that. Jewish people are sent back to the synagogue. Catholics are sent back to Roman Catholicism, to their parish. Yeah. Right. So we, we cannot align ourselves with those people. Right? We don't want to confuse people. It's disobedience to God's word to, to join hands with those people like that. 
That's why we have no desire to join with organizations. We have no desire for 501c3. We have no desire to link our church up to any of these things. We don't want their loans. We don't want their money. We don't want anything from them. We want to preach to them and warn them to flee from the wrath to come. But we want nothing from them. Right? What's that? That's right. We want to love them the biblical way. There are some men that claim they'll go anywhere to preach the word of God without making clear distinctions between unbelievers in general and believers in Christ, right? So, in other words, I would go anywhere outside of any event to, to preach the gospel. I would not join hands with J.D. Greer of the Southern Baptist Convention to preach the Bible at his church, although it would be tempting to preach one message. I tell you, it really would be. To any of those people one time and let her rip, and I wouldn't hold anything. <laughs> I would hold nothing back. I would preach it all until they were ready to kill me. Then I'd be like, okay, got to go. Amen. <laughs> right? But I would love, I, one shot at it, right? I mean, that would be something. But, but, I, but building relationships with these people is wrong, right? It's wrong to do that. We're not to have any fellowship with these people. We're not to have anything to do with them because it causes confusion. That's another way the devil uses that confusion, right? But notice here, lastly tonight, that Paul, he cast out the devil. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. I want you to notice something about Paul's casting out the devil here that was in this woman. Paul did so by the name of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't have days and days of meetings with her and have hours of confessing every sin she ever did. And it doesn't say that it was the will of the girl that the devil cast out of her. It says it's upon the authority of Jesus that it, that it was cast out, right? Amen. Or it didn't say that she had to be reprogrammed and go through and, and have holy water or ceremonies or crosses or any of those other things. Or devil casting out meetings. I met one guy, he, he used to cast devils out of his family all the time. It's like, man, you all got a lot of devils. <laughs> right? Yeah, hell, that's right. What was his very, devil, uh, deliverance is very simple. It's the name of Jesus Christ that cast the devil out. It's the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess, right? Calling upon the name of the Lord by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Ghost, it was gone. That woman was possessed and she was opposing the gospel. The Bible never says that she was saved or that she followed Christ afterwards. Or anything of the sort. It just says the devil was gone. She may have taken devils later. We don't know. Some people have devils out of them only to have seven more worse ones come into them. Right? But nevertheless, the devil was gone without ceremony, without spooky things, or without anything else. It was gone. You'll notice that this devil, though, it grieved Paul to have this devil around him and the deception that was there. Possessed people like this drain the saints of God and cause them to be weary of the, of the oppression. I'm reminded of a lady that stopped, and I told you this story before, but I'll tell it to you again because it was recent, and it goes along with this, that stopped me at the grocery store. I was by myself. I was coming out of the grocery store, and I think she, I think she might have hollered out Pastor Cooley. I can't remember, but she said, she, she said, you told me I was a Jezebel and I was possessed by devils. And I looked at her and said, well, I must have had a good reason for that. That's what I said to her. And then I recognized who she was. This lady was two inches from Dave's face for like, I, I think it was like an hour or two. Oh, yeah, more than two yeah. Hours. It, was, it was more than two hours. She stood right next to his face and she kept saying, Jesus loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Jesus loves you. He loves you. And, he, and she would not stop. Like, could you imagine how crazy that would make you if somebody's right this close to your face and she would not, we could not get her away from him. Well, she tried to tell Ryan that, that he's not like the other, other guys and what's he doing there with you guys? And she was trying, it's a death, I'm telling you, she's possessed. That's why she did it. Just like this lady kept repeating the same thing over and over again for days. Why would you repeat the same thing over? Because she knows it's vexing, and Satan does. And they want to cause confusion, 
right? Right. Yeah, it is. So it's just, it's very similar also, though. It's very similar also to those circumcision guys when we were preaching outside of the, the gospel, outside of the state fair, and they had all their signs, and people thought that we were with them. And they're like, you guys are gross, man. You guys are disgusting. What are you doing? That? I was like, we're not with them. So what did I have to do? I just shout them down. I cranked that amp up, and I preached so hard, and they got so mad they left. I preached every Bible verse on it. I said they were perverts. They're wicked devils. That's what the same thing I do to the JWs when they're on the corner. I do the exact same thing. I preach the deity of Christ, and they get out of there. Right. Oh, those guys were gross, man. It's like they were upset. They came back the next day, but as soon as we came back, they left. Yeah. Just like that lady was doing that, why was she doing that? Why, would, why did she keep doing that over and over again and not leaving him alone? Because she had that same spirit in her. And I told that lady, I said, well, because the apostles went through the same thing. That, that woman had a spirit of divination, and so do you, and that's why you were doing that. And then she tried to drag me into an argument with her at, in all these parking lot, when I'm in the parking lot. And she's trying to, like, get me to stay there and talk to her, and I'm like, yeah, I'll see you later. And I just kept going, you know, I kept walking. And she's like, you're just, a, you're, you're, you're running away. I'm like, yeah, I am. I just want to get my ribs on the trip off. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's like, you're, you're running away. Yeah, I want to be in the middle of a parking lot right next to you, and you can scream that I did something to you. You think I'm stupid, lady? I am sometimes, but not now. I'm out of here. Right? Because I know what people like that do. Sure it was, to pull me into an argument to get me to argue with her. Nah, you had your witness, lady. If you don't want it, see ya. Yeah, exactly. That's another verse they try to use, right? That's what the, the black Hebrew Israelites tried to do to us. They tried to, we were all there, and they said, the wicked flee when none pursue, because we were walking away. I was like, I'm not going to say, you're not getting any gospel preached. And what, I mean, this ain't WrestleMania. We're not going to fight. I'm not going to beat you up. We're not going to have a brawl right here, right? So what's the use of me standing at the corner arguing with people that don't want to hear it, yeah. that oppose the gospel, and you have a religious spirit because you have devils? Uh -huh. So why would I sit there and do that? It's not profitable. I don't have anything to prove to you. I'm here to preach, not to argue with you, right? Because that's what they hate is the preaching. That's what the devil hates is the preaching. He hates it and he wants to stop it. Why do you, they always want to talk to the preacher that's up there preaching? And we'll, we'll all be around and say, hey, can we answer questions for you? No, that guy. I want that guy right there. Right. And I just look at him like, well, you're not getting that guy. He's not going to talk to you. That's just how it is. And they get mad when you say that to them. Right, that's right. Don't get caught up into personal arguments with people when you're on the pulpit. Like, <laughs> I remember one guy that used to be here. He was preaching out there, and he kept <laughs> and he kept going, "You fat sinner! You fat sinner! You fat sinner! You fat sinner!" And that guy went, Wah! And He threw his sandwich up in the air, and he ran, and he charged the <laughs> and he charged the pulpit. Who remembers that? And he charged the pulpit, and one of my other guys was like, and blocked him from getting in there. And he's like, "He wasn't getting through, brother." And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like. I'm like, you, you can't be, yeah, yeah, I think, no, it was a better sandwich than that. It was a really good one. And I saw it, and he just like, and it went up in the air, and that very large man was very upset about that. I thought he was going to go straight through him. That guy was so mad. The moral of the story, don't call people fat sinners, all right? Don't provoke people, right? <laughs> wow, wow, wow. By the way, in closing, though, let me say this to you. Satan's attacks always benefit the saints in the end. Every single one of the times these devils manifest, God gets the victory. The devil was cast out of the woman, and she could no more practice her satanic trade. Next week, we'll actually look at the results of what happens. But every time Satan attacks the saints and seeks to discredit the gospel and seeks to hurt the cause of Christ, in the end, he always loses. Job, when Satan picked a fight with Job, it didn't end well for Satan. God used it to produce the greatest defense manual for afflictions ever. 
how to deal with afflictions, how to deal with sorrow, how to deal with loss, right? Many a man and a woman have been strengthened by Job, right? And so it is with this account. You see some hardships. You see you have a convert like Lydia. And then you go from a convert like Lydia, and man, I'm telling you what, when you're a preacher and you see somebody get saved and get right with God and serving God, man, are you ever uh, full of joy and everything else? And then you get, down the, you get down a few days, and then boom, you get hit with a devil-possessed Jezebel. Yep. Right? It's going to happen. In the ministry, it happens. In the church, it'll happen. Out, out in your life, it will happen. You're going to deal with people like that. You're going to have things like that happen. But in the ministry, expect it. Expect opposition. Be extremely surprised when it does not come. But opposition will come. Why? Because we go against the world. We go against the flesh and the devil. And Satan has an army waiting. Right? He has an army waiting and willing people that are willing to be the human instruments to oppose the gospel. And they are out there. And they are more common than you think. Right? And the next time you deal with something in your life, try to remember people, when you deal with people, try to remember Satan's opposition is there. Satan's opposition is there to the gospel. Satan's opposition is there to hurt your testimony. One of the things that um, uh, Grinnell talks about in his book, I was just reading it, I think, believe it was last night. Um, it could have been the night before, I don't remember. But uh, he talked about how Satan's main goal is to hurt your testimony. I mean, that's like, he can't take your soul. You're already saved. So he wants, to, he wants to bother you, afflict you, oppose you, tempt you. He used a term in there, um, I think it was the agitation, he, Satan wants the agitation of temptation. So he wants to agitate you with temptations, right? That's what he wants to do in your mind. He wants to agitate you with them. Right? Not even that you're interested in them, but he knows it agitates you. So just like Paul, when he was on his road to go, to go preach or to go pray, and that devil came to agitate him. Yeah, because he knows it grieves you. He knows it does. So sometimes you wonder when fiery darts are thrown your way in the work of the Lord. And you can't imagine why a thought would cross a Christian mind like that. Fiery darts. Invading thoughts. Right? Thoughts that affect you. Thoughts that, that uh, vex your soul. That make you agitated. That make you afraid. That make you full of doubts and fears. Or, or, or just um, make your mind to, to suffer affliction and torment. That's not by accident. It's by design. And we have to pray through those things. We have, to, we have to serve God through those things in all faithfulness. Satan's goal is to knock you off course. That is his goal. His goal when Paul was on the way to pray was to knock him off course, to distract his mind, to keep him from prayer. You, don't, you and I don't get to use an excuse that, well, Satan made me do it or Satan distracted me. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes Satan does distract us. He agitates us many times. His, his kingdom does. His, his devils. But you and I have a duty before God. And we have a duty to continue on like Paul did. We have a, continue on to, uh, a duty to continue on and lift up the name of Jesus. And use the authority that God has given us in the word of God. And by faith in Christ and our place in Christ, not where you're at today in your trial, but you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, high above all of those things. And we ought to live above all of those things, right? We ought to do our best to live above all those things and know that these, these trials, these afflictions 
are, they're coming our way, right? They will come our way. They will happen just like they did to Paul. And people, you'll be surprised. When you, you, when you look at human interaction with people, I want you to think about what is Satan, what is his kingdom trying to do here, right? Because remember, our wrestling is not against flesh and blood. There's a spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Yes, those people are guilty. They're allowing it, but they're taken captive. We need to see that, and we need to pray against that and pray against the spirit that's behind that because these people aren't smart enough to do what they do to you sometimes. They're just not. You give people too much credit. They're not that smart, right? They've got this, there's, you know, when we talk about that conspiracy, right, that word that comes together, there's a spirit behind it. That's what that means. Well, there's a spirit behind your afflictions when it comes to that. There's a spirit behind that opposition that you face. There's a spirit behind that, right, when they bring up your church, like what you're doing at church or something like that, right? Yeah. Well, why do they do that? Because the spirit that's in them, that's why. They, they can't help it. Like, you think they can help it, and they should control themselves better, and they really can't. That presence of the Holy Spirit in you, it bothers them. It should bother them, shouldn't it? Amen. If you're living for God, it's going to bother people. If it ain't agitating people like Satan tries to agitate us, we agitate them too. Right? We do. Our... We, our testimony agitates them. Why? It's a constant reminder that they're lost and dead in sins and they don't want to obey God. Your life is a constant reminder to them of that when you live for God. So remember that. You have your Lydia's and then you have your devil-possessed women. You'll have both of them and you'll deal with both of them. You'll deal with both kinds of opposition. But look how Paul dealt with it. He continued on in the work that God had called him to do. And he dealt with it. He didn't avoid it. He hit it head on. Right? And that's what you and I have to do. Don't try to weasel around the devil. Don't try to weasel around things like that. Deal with them. With the power and the authority of the Word of God. That's how we deal with things. That's what God's commanded us to do. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your words. Thank you for... The Bible, thank you for teaching us very practical lessons that we need to learn. Help us, Lord, when we see people that wrong us, that hurt us, that aren't kind to us, that hate us, that you promised that all those things would happen. And they have a spirit in them that leads them to do that. And help us to use it, rather, for the furtherance of the gospel, like Paul did. And many will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.